Hi my friends, it's Ro. Welcome back to my channel. Today I have an amazing interview with a man named CW. He did a whole bunch of time. He was sentenced back in 2000 under the old crack cocaine law. Then years later, I think it was eight or nine years later, the Supreme Court changed that law. There was this sentencing disparity and from that day forward, they were not allowed to sentence people to life sentences for crack cocaine the way that they did CW. He wound up sitting in jail for 10 years, a decade after Congress came in and said, no, that law is wrong. We can't sentence people like that anymore. It still took him a decade to get home. So he's here to share his story on how he stayed strong during, how he removed himself from the gang life, got his life on track, got into coaching inside of prison, got out, broke statistics, is killing the game. And these are all of his secrets that you can pass along to your loved one or just learn just because you got wrapped up in the system for a really long time. He did close to 20 years. You don't have to be a victim to that system and get trapped in that revolving door. So without wasting any more time, here's CW. Make sure you stay until the end because he shares his social media handles, how you can reach out to him. He's doing amazing things. So I'll put all that information below as well. Here's CW and his story. Leave him some love in the comments below. My name is Charles Woods. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I served 20 years in um, federal prison for um, the sale of crack cocaine. Um, I was released July 17th of 2019 due to the First Step Act, which, the, which derived from the Fair Sentencing Act of 2010 that President Obama passed, which made the crack law from 100 to 1, the racial discriminatory crack law from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1, which um, allowed to release men who were sentenced under 100 to 1. Um, unfortunately for me, I wasn't sentenced to, I wasn't able to get released in 2010 because the Fair Sentencing Act wasn't made retroactive and therefore it only affected the men who came in after um, June um, of 2010. And um, so I had to remain for another 10 years until they passed the First Step Act, which was passed by Donald Trump in 2019, I mean 2018, December of 2018, and which made the fair, which made the um, 18 to 1 crack law retroactive, which, which gave me relief. How did it feel? What was it like knowing that the government came in and said, this is it, like this law was wrong, all of these people are getting out or they're not getting sentenced the way that you were sentenced and then sitting in jail for 10 more years of full decade after they admitted they were wrong, after they admitted that the law that you were sentenced under was invalid, no good. What was it like every day living like that, knowing that you're still serving all this time or they want you to serve all this time? I would have been tracking the law for, for, for like a year and a half. So it was, the, it was, it was being debated should it be was it should it be retroactive or uh, should it not be retroactive being that i had been in prison almost 10 years at, at that point i had i had been in the law library doing a lot of research on my case and found found different types of appeals and trying to get back in court on different type of uh, case law that, that 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 fitted my case or laws that had been passed but i had learned also before 2010 that you know the word retroactive was a was a major component to being able to get back into into court on different cases and so when i learned about what retroactivity was um i re, I re, a lot of them cases that i was probably that i was trying to get back in court on prior before the um uh, fair sense act was passed i realized that you can't get back in court because most of the cases or most of the case law or most of the laws that they pass is not retroactive they don't, they don't affect people right then at that moment and so when they passed the first when they was uh this making decisions on the first step act wasn't going to be retroactive, was it not going to be retroactive. I had already came, the groups in my mind, if they don't make it retroactive, then, you know, I just got to continue to fight on and struggle on. Uh, I was under the belief that they was going to make it retroactive because I'm, I'm like, it don't, it fits, it fits, it fits the man best who been, who was in prison uh, before, who was in prison before the law was passed for um, the unjust 100 to one crack law. So it only, it should only fit, uh, us perfectly, not the men who's coming in afterwards. Of course, they're going to get the benefits of it anyway. Um, but when they then make it retroactive, 
Um, I took it in stride and, and continued to move forward and figured they was gonna make they was gonna have to make this retroactive sooner or later because uh, they knew they knew it was unjust. They knew it was it was it was thousands and thousands of men that were sitting in federal prison under the hundred and one crack law. That's amazing that you didn't get angry and bitter and lose your way because it's just it's so easy to lose hope. I can only imagine in there. And you had told me that when you first started doing your time, you did it one way. And then you went to McKean and you changed the way that you were doing time. And it helped you to be able to prepare to get out and stay out. So what did it look like when you first got inside and how long did you live like that? And then what changed when you got to McKean, when you decided to move your life to a different path? I got locked up in November of 2000. I was in, I was at trial February of 2000. 2001, I was sentenced February 15th. So you have to think that's only like, I was in trial within three months. Then if, from February 15th to June, I was sentenced to, I had my sentence here and I was sentenced to 30 years, 30 years in federal prison. So you have to think that I was, I had been, uh, I had been on a, a quick roller coaster ride. So I went from being in society all my life to uh, being a, going to federal prison within an instant. So mentally, you know, that was a shock. It was a shock wave. And I was still mentally programmed from, from being in society because it's not like I had been in jail a long time. I only had been in jail up to like on nine months from, com from coming from society. So when I got to federal, when I got to federal prison, I, my mind was still activating the program as it was, smoking weed, drinking, hanging out with my, with, with, with my, with my gang. Um, the organization that I that I was that I was, that I was rolling with. So when you, when I got to federal prison, the federal prison is then the, the BOP then then guide me to the, the psych department where you know to give me some understanding on on guide on hey how to uh, digest receiving a 30 year prison sentence fresh out of society and, and, and within nine months. So I came right to federal prison um, and got with my, my organization, got with the gang, I knew, got with my buddies and and basically resume life in prison. The only difference was it just wasn't women. I came right in and smoking weed and drinking and hanging out and doing all the nonsense and becoming bitter and angry and mad. And, and at, a, at a certain point, as I began to do my time, I, I come to I had come to realize I had become to have to make right decisions in my life. What do you What do you want to do with yourself? And, and that wasn't until I got to McKean in two thousand in two thousand eight where I began to do my transition mentally. And I, and I was fighting with myself on what, 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 what should I do? And I got the research and like, do people, how people ever really done this time? Like how, how people really done 30 years or been in jail a long, long time. And I do my research and get to thinking like, yeah, you know, Mandela did 29 years and got out and became the president of his country. You know, Malcolm X did, you know, 10 years and 12 years and, and became, and got out of prison, became an international figure. And, now you, then you have people that's sitting in prison like um, Mr. Larry Hoover, who's been in prison almost 40, almost 40 years of his, his life. And all these men um, still, were still motivated and, and, and was still was uplifting and, and was encouraging and, and still believed that, hey, it's a better day lie ahead. When I did that research, I'm like, man, well, you know, if people have done this time. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm Malcolm X or, or Mandela on none of those people on none of that level, but those people was a guiding light. And so when I did that, fact check and check that history, then I began to empower myself. And when I got to McKean, I came across a group of men who had began to uplift themselves and educate themselves. And these men had a lot of time like Adam Clarkson and uh to live and, and, and Cantu and and Keith and Keith James and Mr. Board and Mr. King and and O'Malley. And so these men was was educating themselves and uplifting themselves and, and and seeking out a better path in life. That's incredible. And I just love how you keep going back to mindset and empowerment because I've been involved with Adam for so long and I've interviewed so many people who have done time. And I think that, not I think that even, I know that it's that mindset that has carried them through. So what advice do you have for the women who are here watching and they're kind of newer to their sentence and their loved one is inside still doing what you did for that time before you got to McKean, before you started studying those people and using them to influence you. What do you suggest for him or her on the outside to do to help support them and maybe help guide them onto the right path? I mean, people in society is limited to what they could do. You know, they feel powerless. That's how I know that's how my, my, my mother felt who supported me. 
1,000 um, percent. I gave her the Purple Heart when I came home, actually. But um, she 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 felt powerless, and, and and your family your family as a whole feel powerless, and your friends they just feel like it's nothing they could do to it's nothing no it's, they don't it's no real impact they can have on your life. But what I come to realize is that they just have to, the small things is is what count. You know, just being supportive or asking asking different types of questions or just being seeking seeking to be very concerned. I know the, the regular things like visits and sending money, yeah, that's the bare basic. But when you have them on the phone, just just seeing where their mind at, what they're into, what they what what do they like to do, you know, ask them questions. Ask ask more of the what question. What are you trying to do with your life? What what are you doing? You know, um, seek out seek out uh, get an understanding on what type of uh, educational programs they 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 into, or what type of uh, dreams or aspirations they have, and, and and help them with those things, and in 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 the way you can help them, like if they whatever they want to be, you can send them books on that. You could you could continually challenge them, and you know if they're changing because you're gonna know through they through they through their conversation, you're gonna know from the from the way they talk to you. You're gonna know when you see them when you come on visit and see them how they conduct themselves. You're gonna know if, if they are um, in pursuit of a, of a better life or in pursuit of not wanting to, to become back come back to prison and, and, and want better for themselves and and for their family members. You also, you know, if you're sending your family members a lot of money and you take and you you sending them money, ask them where that money going. Ask them what is they doing with the money. You know, they some people get a lot of money in prison. Um, to be honest, a lot of people get a lot of money. You get you get people get money whereas you know, you can ask you for real, for real, take your college course, or you could pay for a, 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 a pay for schooling to some extent, and you get you get you get your books in the mail, and and, and, and uh, you take your course or whatever you, whatever course you want to take in school, whatever schooling, whatever type of course you want to take in school. So um, it, it's it, it be seeming like well, you know, I don't have the money to do this, I don't have the money to do that. But I went to I, I became a paralegal um, while in while in prison. And that course, that that course, that course costed fifty dollars a month. So I know it's possible. So um, with the with the family members and the and the, and the women who who are in support of their ones, their loved ones in prison, just be more more encouraging and, and ask a lot of questions, uh, support them in in their causes. And I'm be honest with you. And if they actually running through a lot of money, they running through a lot of money in in, in prison after you have sent them a, their initial money. The initial money and they've they been there for a while, then they're doing something they don't have no business doing. That's so helpful because it's one thing for me to say that and to give the advice as somebody who's seen a lot, but it's such a different story when you're the one giving the advice because you lived it, you saw it, you saw what people do every single day. So thank you for validating that. You did a ton of time. So what was that transition like? prior to leading up to maybe the couple of months weeks before getting out and then when you did get out because we hear a ton about ptsd and how hard it is to reintegrate into society especially the longer that you do that's a good question you know a lot of people see me and they say i don't want to give a false reality of this how you know the way i got out of prison is this is the way you know men get out of prison after doing 20 years or 30 years or you know coming off a life sentence and give them a the chance to be released back into society. That um, and it's, it's the few men I just named. The most, most majority of those men are back in society as well, and uh, it's a very small group of men. Uh, when you get out of society, that that um, gets out and, and, and prevail and, and, and stay on their path, and that's a challenge. That's the real challenge. With me, I knew that 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 it would be a struggle returning back to society. I knew it was gonna be hard. I knew I had been gone a long time, and I had accepted that in my mind. And when I accepted that, I knew well, hell, I just I've been sitting in prison, you know, 15, 20 years, you know, and, and, and it was a hard, it was hard, and it was a struggle. You know, if I get re if I get a chance to get back into society soon, then it, it's gonna be it's gonna be a struggle. It's gonna be hard, but at least I have more resources, you know, and I could and I could reach out to other, I could reach out to people who who who, who may who may uh, want to help me. Uh, being that they saying that that I have transitioned and transformed my thoughts and and empowered myself and carried myself way better than before I came to prison. Um, with that said, like I said, I began to educate myself. I didn't take the bitter, mad, angry route. I took I, I did I, initially I took the, the 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 mad, bitter, angry route, but I transitioned from then to realize I had to I had to better myself. I had to educate myself. I had to motivate self motivate myself, 
I had to be consistent, persistent. I had to embrace uh, truth. I had to embrace peace. I had to embrace uh, loyalty. I had to embrace these things more. And I had to come to understand that um, barriers do exist. And what I began to do is when men came into prison and men who left prison and came back, because I had been there so long, so I've seen a lot of men leave prison and come back, I began to question them. I began to ask them what was their barriers what was they stumbling blocks? And when they gave me insight on their barriers out there in society and, and, and they stumbling blocks, then I began to embrace those and, know, and knew that I could face those barriers and those stumbling blocks. And so when I knew what I was looking, what I was looking at or what the future could look like for me, I began to prepare a little bit more mentally as well um, with those uh, barriers and stumbling blocks that men before me had already went through. And so that helped me out a lot as well. And then when I returned to society, I had a decent support system. And like I said, people had seen my change. My parents and them had seen my change. My family members had seen the change and the transition. And uh, they was willing to help in any way they could help. And that's what, and that's what I pretty much did. That's such good advice. It's so excellent. Okay, so now you did about two decades in prison. And you changed your life. And you got out. And the transition was relatively smooth, we'll say. Now what? What have you been doing in this time you've been home? Remind us how long you've been home. What do you have going on? When I was released, like I said, in July 17th, I was given a great opportunity by a company that um, gave me a chance to come work for them. I had to work for them for um, 90 days before they actually hired me on. Uh, they gave me a, um, good wages and great benefits. So I've been working my job. I have a seven to, seven, um, seven to three job. Um, I have great hours. I'm off on the weekends. I have no complaints there. Um, uh, I've been working on continuously um, empowering people. I, I do um, of videos once or twice a week. I um, I do speaking engagements. Um, I'm into um, uh, I'm doing my life coaching. I'm also working with uh, the group. The, of the men I just spoke about earlier, just just came that came that's home as well. O'Malley, um, Keith James, um, Vince King, to live. Um, also Adam as well because he's still hands on even though he's in prison, still in prison. He's still hands on. I'm working with the, um, the organization that they have put together um, called Rika, uh, the Reentry Coaching Academy. I've been working with them lately. Um, I'm also into uplifting the youth motivational speaking. I'm seeking to, I'm seeking to be to give men to understand that hey, no matter how, what type of times you're going to, through, how hard it seems, how dark the tunnel is, you know, there's always a beacon of light. There's always a light at the end of that tunnel. And the light is the is, is the people you can point to that say they didn't made it, they didn't done it. You know, they have regrouped, they have transformed themselves, they have they have sought to better themselves and they went through the darkness as well. They went through trying, trying times. And I seek to be one of those people as well to be the the uh, light in the darkness that 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 small beacon of light you know to give to people or give the young and give people who's going through trying times in, in prison state and federal prison to let them know man you we could you could regroup it's not it's not over with you know you i know men who have had life sentences like like uh vince king who just came home off a of life sentence i know men who just came home off life sentences who, who thought they wasn't ever getting out ever in their lives and they and they and they made it and they and they out here working hard, they got their own companies, they, they have empowered with themselves, they have regressed back into uh, the same behavior they once was doing um, years ago. And, um, and, and those people are, are the light. And that's what I seek to be. I seek to be part of the light in the darkness. That's incredible. And I've always heard that when you take your struggles and your pain and you use that to fuel your purpose, like that's what life is all about. And that's beautiful. And I think that the lesson here throughout that I've felt at least weaved a kind of a theme is mind over matter, keeping that positive attitude and empowering yourself just to kind of put your head down and truck through it because you were faced with a choice when you first got there, when you first got released throughout this whole entire time to either stay with the gang life and go to the poker tables and whatever else people do in there, watch TV all day, or educate yourself and get involved in coaching and then continuing that, that out here. And that's the lesson I think that I want to pass along to everybody today is to use you as that beautiful example that you can make the best of your second chance and you don't have to get trapped in that revolving door that it seems like the system wants you guys caught in and our families caught in. 
if you just grab life by its horns and go for it. So you are such an inspiration and I would love to have everybody connect with you and follow along with those videos that you do every week and potentially book you for speaking engagements or coaching for their loved ones. So where can we all find you? It's like everybody else. <laughs> I'm on Instagram, Facebook. Um, on, on Instagram, I'm Life Coach um, underscore CW. I'm on YouTube as Life Coach CW. And I'm on uh, Facebook as um, just my name, Charles Woods. Every day I do a message of the day, quote of the day. Every day except on the weekends, I put out a, a quote of the day, a message to the people every day. I seek to continue to empower what people through my quotes. I, I have done a array of, of array of them since I've been home. I think one lady seen them that um, I was at one. I was at a, um, a criminal justice reform um, uh, session or meeting, and she went through my Facebook page. She was like, "When did you get home?" And I told her, "She's like, I can't believe you came. You you just came home. You just you have done so many quotes. It's like you've been home. <laughs> you've been home forever, you know." So um, I think those quotes are good. I think the, the messages are. For people to wake up every morning and, and hear some type of message, uh, some type of motivating message, some type of message to get them going. Uh, and they're not all messages of, of, of just to get you pumped up or super motivated. They're also just, they're also just uh, thoughts to put on the mind as you're moving out through your day to continue to give you a reminder of certain things that you might be going through or certain ways you might be thinking. You know, it's just, it's all about the, it's all about your, your, your mental at the end of the day. That's what it's all about, period, right now, especially what we're going through as far as with COVID-19. It's all just a, a mental fight. It's all about um, understanding that, you know, this too shall pass, you know, just like anything else. What beautiful words to leave everybody with. This too shall pass. I always tell everyone we're one day closer. So I will link all of your information in the description box below. Everybody, please go follow CW, follow along his journey, get some inspiration from him for your loved one. And also, I would just love to see you guys give him some love in the comments below because he deserves it. He deserves all the encouragement that he could possibly get and all the praise that he could get for making the best of his horrible situation, getting out, staying out and doing amazing things and using this time to not only be the example and the guiding light for all of us from the distance, but also he's actually in the trenches still and coaching everybody else and helping kind of pull your loved one along and out of the garbage of it all too. So I cannot thank you enough. I would love to have you back on. We talked about potentially doing a live video like I did with Coochie, which I would absolutely love. I've been having the worst, as you're aware, the worst internet issues since COVID. So as soon as I can get somebody out here to get my Wi-Fi fixed, I would love, love, love to set that up if you are still up for that. And is there anything else I forgot to ask you or anything that you want to leave anybody with before we go? I did think we did forget about the, um, about the coaching program. And because that is a significant uh, piece to the puzzle, the culture program that was going on at McKean and the um, the struggles that it took to get that program off the ground, the back the backlash that um, to live and, and Adam and the and, and the group we see the men we see who sought to um, institute that program, a lot of the backlash that they got through the, from the BOP and um, some of the some of the wardens who came who came and was taken over the prison. Um, I do want to say that the program was wonderful. It, it helped me transition into the, the man I have become today. Um, Dr. Ritter, who helped, who was in, who was, who helped in conjunction with uh, Talib and Adam to get the program off the ground within the prison system. She's a wonderful person. She gave me a scholarship to take the coaching program and she should be forever blessed for um, her love for um, the men in federal prison she sought to give back and, and to want men to transition and come back to society to have a better life and to, uh, to have to be armed with some type of um, career to um, do better in life. So she, I have to um, thank her for that. And, and the men like Adam and, and Talib and O'Malley and Mr. Boyd and Keith James and Cantu and Mr. King, you know, these men was very inspirational men in my life. And they was, they was very inspirational men to a lot of men lives that was in McKean and still are as Adam is still in McKean. These men uh, must be recognized as well. I think that as they say, you know, you have to give the people their roses while they're here, not when they die, not when they're dead. And so you, you have to give them their roses now. And so I would like to commend those men because I looked at, I looked, 
I gave those men a hard time when they first started started the coaching program. I just when they first started the corp for I just thought they was just a bunch of men who wanted to be good in prison and were seeking a way out and they was just using that just to get out of prison. And so like I said, I was from the uh, I was from the gang lifestyle. So I, I was like I wanted to watch these men and, and see if they were genuine men or were they men who who they say they were. You know, were they just preaching education, upliftment and motivation and life coaching and then leaving from the educational building going back to you know, their units to the yard, you know, hanging out, talking mess and, and doing what we, what, what I'm already doing, you know, so I watched these men and, and, uh, and they was men of their words and they were standing on what they believe and they was about um, better than, better in the men condition. That's what pulled me in. Um, the, and the people, the, the administration, and there's only was a small group of people who was in support of the life coaching program at McKinney. Let's just be clear on that as well. And it was the ward Miss Folk, um, Warden Bobby Meeks, um, Warden Miss, Mrs. Rick uh, Reckonwall. She was a wonderful ward. She she really um, helped the men out. She really gave her all. She was willing to lose her job to uh, get the program fully instituted and to start four reentry programs within McCain. And she and uh, she was one. I call her the most hated warden in McCain because the administration and the and the officer staff did not like her because of the plight she took on with. Um, seeking to um, uh, reform the men and seeking to really be about uh, rehabilitation. She wasn't just, it wasn't just a word. She actually was, she actually sought to define the word by taking action. And um, Mrs. Miller, she was a wonderful lady who also worked hand in conjunction with Ms. Reckonwall. Ms. Harrington, who was right now still in McCain working with Adam, still working with to keep the programs alive much as she, much as she can. She has received a lot of backlash from the BOP, a lot of backlash from the from the officers, the officer union, BOP union. She has received, she has, she fight every day. So uh, this need, these things need to be uh, spoken upon because these are, are the things in the backdrop that the people never hear about how people that seek to actually help to reform men and seek to rehabilitate men and se seek to help men become transformative within prison. These staff members get a lot of, uh, Get a get a get a hard time uh, in in the prison system. They call them thug huggers. They call them they call them all type of names while they're in there. But these people still fight on, you know. So, um, Mr. Whitmore and Mrs. Whitmore. These these are this is these, these people I just named to you are people who was in McKean who fought with the the inmates to to become uh, to get these program instituted and to keep these program instituted. So I would like to, um, that's all I would like to say in, in that area. And I also would like to thank you for allowing me the chance to, to come on, your, to you come on your platform and to um, give the people insight um, about my plight and insight about the BOP. I also um, want to say that, that um, your struggle was as far as having a, a loved one in prison or a husband in prison and your plight as well. You are a wonderful person for taking on that struggle and, and that's not easy. I know for a fact it's not easy, probably because I was just there. My mama, my mother, is to, is to some extent just like you. She she rode twenty years straight, you know, and and that was a hard struggle. That's a hard fight, you know. You you have to fight every single day, and once again, it's a mental pain, you know. So uh, I I thank you for for being the woman you have um, sought to be within the criminal justice reform, within the support of your husband, within the the all the bureaucrats and the red tape you all facing with the struggle of getting out of home. And uh, all I can say is that I, I, I commend you, and uh, your platform is a wonderful platform, and people should continue to support you and get and, and seek you out to get more understanding on um, their loved ones in federal prison, their loved ones in state prison, and and uh, I just want, thank you for keeping it real. I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much. I don't, I couldn't think of a better way to end it when you're talking about the warden and all of those people. Adam and I call that the girl power years, or at least I named it that because it was, wow, it was unbelievable just to be on the outside part of it and hearing all of those stories. And I don't know if you watched the show For Life with 50 Cent. No. It's about a guy who, oh, it's a really good oh, show. Yeah, 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 I see, yeah, I've seen the, the lawyer guy. Yes. So yeah. that warden reminds me so much, and Adam says it too, because now I have him watching it, reminds me of back when the warden you were talking about, Ms. I don't Rick want to say Rick Rick Yes. Wall. And that's what, yes. 
I always say that they, she reminds me so much of her and oh, such a good show, such a good time. And hopefully Adam will be here sooner than later doing these interviews with me and back with the coaching with you guys. So thank you so much for doing this for me. Thank you so much for being an example and a guiding light for everybody else, because we know we're well aware of those statistics. And I think it's like 70% of people within the first year go right back in. So you are going against the grain. You are being successful. You are setting the table for everybody else coming up behind you and proving that you don't have to fall into the trap, that you can beat statistics. So I'm looking forward to doing this again. Thank you again for your time and we'll see you on the next one. All right. Thank you. So again, make sure that you go find CW on social media. Leave him some love in the comments below. Do me a favor and give this video a thumbs up. It's just a way that you can help me help people like CW, help people like Adam, help people like all of our loved ones who are inside of prison by getting their stories and our side out there because so many people are just so misinformed and ignorant, not their fault. They just don't know what it's like behind those walls and what we as family members have to go through. Also subscribe so you don't miss any other videos by me. Ring that bell so you're the first to know when they're posted and you get a chance at first comment. I love you guys and I will see you in the next one.